This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to Roots and All. This week's guest is Philip Oostenbrink, head gardener at Warmer Castle and Gardens, collections coordinator for Plant Heritage in Kent, plant trials committee member for the RHS, and self-confessed jungle plant nut. Philip has just published a new book titled The Jungle Garden, and in this interview, I talk to him about what a jungle garden is, whether they can work in shady and sunny aspects, easy jungle plants, rarer ones, plant hardiness, seasonal and winter interest, and where to get plants. I began by asking what sparked Philip's interest in jungle gardens. Um, I think it's because I I saw several gardens which are just which were beautiful and um uh, the first one I saw was uh, Tresco Abbey on the Isles of Scilly, and I went there in 1998. And I still lived in the Netherlands then, and yeah, there were just a lot of things there that you, were just completely exotic and tropical to me, and I'd never seen before. And I'm a bit of a, a plantaholic, so if anything's rare and unusual, I, I like it. Um, but then I um, I went to Will Giles's garden in Norwich, uh, the exotic garden there, and I think that really sparked the interest because that was such a beautiful jungle garden with little paths going through and you sort of had to find your way through the, the undergrowth and, and go through. Um, so that's also when I already lived in the UK and uh, then I started finding more of those plants myself and discovering what I could grow here myself as well. Uh, and I think that's that's sort of what it was. It, I was always interested in foliage anyway. Uh, even when I was at Horticultural College, I, um, I looked a lot at the foliage of plants when I designed a garden. Um, but uh, yeah, I think especially Will Giles' garden was probably one of those where I thought, yeah, I do want this and I do really like this. Mm. Yeah. So are you actually inspired by the jungle itself and how it how the plants adapt and how they grow together when you do design spaces? Yes, I am, because um, like in a jungle, um, if I create a jungle garden, I look at like the upper canopy first. So uh, what can I do as good visual plants that will also allow some undergrowth? Um, and I think um, it is one big inspiration because you have the upper canopy in the jungle, then you've got the slightly lower uh, stuff in the middle and loads of things on the floor where there's hardly any any bare soil and yeah, lots of plants cre- creeping through there. So I think that is definitely an inspiration that you you try and get that same effect um, in a smaller space or even like on a patio if you can. Mm. Yeah, and I thought it was really interesting reading the book because I think a lot of people might assume that a jungle garden is just green foliage. Um, but you talk about the importance of seasonal changes. So how might you incorporate that into a, a jungle garden scheme? Well, I think if you look at the garden, of course, you want something over winter. Um, so you have a certain structure within your uh, your garden. So you could use something, for instance, like a, a trachycarpus, uh, so sort the of hardy, uh, hardy palm. Um, which is evergreen, so you have that all year round. But um, yeah, other things, of course, uh, come and go a bit, and I, I do think that's important because you get that um, sort of that needs to go through your garden, have a look in your garden, and explore to see what's different, what's come up, um, what has maybe disappeared, even because some things might be summer dormant. Uh, so yeah, you, you can use that a lot, and yeah, I do find that very important because if you have a garden that is just the same all the time then after a while you've just seen it and you just think, well, I don't really have to explore because I know exactly what's in there. Mm, yeah, I think people might not realise as well, you mentioned uh, that you can get colour changes of on foliage uh, and I think mm. people might not necessarily think that goes in, hand in hand with the jungle garden. Oh, yeah, definitely. Because um, jungle garden doesn't mean you just grow exotics because I think that's sort of the difference between uh, what a lot of people think of maybe as a tropical garden and the jungle garden, I think with the jungle garden, you can use a lot of uh, even normal uh, plants you can get in a garden centre. So um, yeah, quite common plants, but it's that effect you want. So you want the lushness and the, the differences in uh, in foliage uh, shapes and textures. And yeah, definitely. Um, I've got um, a, an Aurelia, for instance. Uh, the common name is Devil's Walking Stick. And it's got this beautiful large leaf. And in autumn, that'll turn bright yellow and bright red. Uh, all kinds of colours before the leaves drop. So, um, yeah, it it gives more then. And then, of course, in spring, you could grow things uh, that are early spring flowering bulbs. Like I've got some 
a really funky variegated uh, fritillaria imperialis, the um, uh, imperial crowns. And they're the flowers sort of from February onwards, uh, and they're really good as well. So you, know, you can definitely work with the seasons, and you don't want to have the same stagnant garden all the time, but you just have some colour changes uh, even in spring, but uh, definitely in autumn as well. Mm. So you wouldn't be uh, averse to mixing plants from, say, different continents or different eco-regions? Uh, no, I wouldn't. See, I, um, a jungle garden, because it is so dense, um, you can almost create a little microclimate within your own garden uh, so what i've done in my garden because it's um southeast facing so it gets a lot of sunshine in my back garden in summer when the sun is high up um it's almost all day i get sunshine and it uh, shines over the house even um and um when you start with that upper canopy you can uh sort of create a bit of a microclimate underneath so um, it holds moisture in a bit but also it creates shade um, so you can then use things from different areas, different uh, regions altogether and different altitudes even um, to um, yeah, to get really the impact of a jungle garden. So to get all the differences in, in leaf shapes and textures. Mm. Yeah. So, so that's an important point as well. You could have a, a garden because, again, I think people think jungle garden, shady, you know, slightly more humid, maybe. Uh, but mm. your garden sits in full sunshine. Do you then need to create that canopy or is it possible to have the jungle garden with plants that do cope with full sunshine? Oh, that's definitely possible, yes. Um, I've got a tetrapanix, which uh, actually quite likes full sunshine as well. That's very tolerant. But the the main one, I would uh, say, to create a, a good leafy effect in the garden, in, which is uh, in full sunshine, is uh, different figs. Um, I've got quite a few myself, so I've got um, the normal fig, Ficus carica, but then a cultivar called um, Ice Crystal, which has got this beautiful leaf, which is almost like a snowflake if you look at it. Um, but others are, for instance, uh, Ficus uh, Johannes, which is smaller and you can easily grow in a pot as well. But you still got all these different leaf shapes and different leaf textures, uh, which yeah, you can just grow in sunshine. And there are loads of plants that you can grow in sunshine that still give you that lush effect. Uh, you could also work with succulents, for instance. So you could work with um, uh, the hardy aloe, so uh, aloe ampelos striatula, uh, which can tolerate full sunshine and no water for for months on end, really. So uh, there's, there's loads of plants you could uh, grow in a sunny garden as well as a shady garden. If I was thinking about winter interest, you mentioned the trachycarpus. And before we started recording, I said about the Dixter exotic garden. And in the winter... You've got a few conifers in there and you've got some maybe bananas that have been wrapped in various different contraptions to overwinter them. So that for for me, that garden kind of is fairly bare in the winter, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case, I presume. Oh, no, it doesn't. No, you can uh, you can have quite a few evergreens in there, actually. And uh, uh, I've worked with ferns, um, another plant I love. And I've got a national collection of is Hakanokloa, which is the uh, Japanese forest grass. Uh, which likes it quite shady. Um, and although it grows brown uh, in autumn, uh, it sort of goes this beautiful, like a wheat colour almost. And you can just leave that until, um, say, early March before you cut it back. So you still have that structure and that linear leaf within your, your garden then. And um, uh, yes, I mentioned ferns, uh, the hard stung fern, for instance, uh, Asplenium scolopendrum. That's a really nice evergreen one, which starts coming up again in March. Um, so you don't have to cut it back until then. Um, so yeah, that's just a few examples, but uh, there are definitely lots of things you can have. And, and it doesn't all have to be evergreen, of course, because then you still get that, that it is quite samey throughout the year. But I think if you start planting out, if you use a structure, maybe you could even start with the evergreens and uh, plan those out. And then you know, well, this is also going to look uh, great in winter. I know there's still uh, some interest in winter as well then. And also thinking about the different types of plants that you use uh, and you said, you know, you can kind of mix and match. Is there any place at all for more traditional cottage style plants? Oh, definitely. Yes. I'm, I'm growing fuchsias as well, for instance. <laughs> so uh, you could do that. Um, and, and other perennials as well. Um, uh, one of the ones that um, is used in cottage gardens as well is uh, the hardy sunflower. Uh, and uh, I've got Helianthus salicifolia, so that is the one with uh, willow-leaved uh, foliage, really long, thin leaves. 
um, and uh, it's just about to flower actually. It's uh, a beautiful perennial that grows up to oh, two, two and a half meters at least uh, every year. Um, so that's one you could use. And the other thing I use a lot is uh, is dahlias. And personally, I feel with a jungle garden, I um, I don't use very bright flowers because I think then you're going more towards the like the tropical exotic look. And um, so for me, it is really about the foliage. But if I use flowers, then um, I will use something with, which is a bit more subdued, maybe, and which will still look beautiful when you uh, look at it up close, but it doesn't jump out at you, so it doesn't take over. If you look in the garden, then the first thing you see is a massive pink flower. Um, but one uh, dahlia, for instance, which is definitely a cottage garden plant, is uh, a Verone's obsidian, which is this wagon wheel, almost black dahlia. And that, that's just a beautiful thing with bright yellow center. Um, and yeah, I just love that. And I will always have that in, in my jungle garden as well. So. You can't really ma- match, but it's just, it's mainly about the uh, the look of the plant. So if you look at something, oh, look, is it lush? Is it uh, maybe nice and green? Is it good, beautiful foliage? Then um, yeah, you could use almost anything to uh, to achieve that look. Yeah, it's it sounds, uh, I think it comes across that it could be quite a personal interpretation of the theme. Um, and it was, when I was reading the book, I did wonder, I thought, you know, you have, such an, a gift for putting plant shapes and textures and contrasting them with each other. Um, so think about more about the mechanics of writing the book. Did you have to take what was maybe an instinctual visual art that you had personally that was almost innate for grouping plants? And and did writing the book make you think about that process? And, and was it difficult to actually say, OK, this is what I do and to define what was the jungle look? Um, yeah, I think it was because it was uh, indeed one of those things where I just always sort of naturally just had that thing. Oh, I don't like that next to each other because the the leaves are too similar; they're the same shape, and I want to break that up a bit. Um, it, it's yeah to sort of look at that, and uh, it was also part of how I um, redid my own garden earlier this spring. So uh, when you think about this jungle gardening, and I was starting to think about uh, writing this book. I looked at my own garden and I thought, well, how have I done this and how have I combined things? And then sometimes you look at things when you plant them out in spring and I'll move them four times, probably sometimes uh, some of them, because I just look at it and I think, no, it still does not look right. I need something to break that up. Um, so uh, it's it's something that I maybe subconsciously do, but sometimes I have to look at things and then later I think, no, it, it's not right. I do need to move that a bit. But um, yeah, the writing the book has really inspired me to uh, to look at my own garden again, and um, uh, I've changed it quite a bit actually, and and really focused on uh, a lot of greens because I do like the the lush greeners. But um, variegation is also one of my <laughs> my loves. So uh, yeah, trying to incorporate the two and uh, trying to make the garden even more interesting and really almost work by the rules that I've written about. Yeah, and a- another thing people might assume is that a lot of the plants that you use wouldn't necessarily be winter hardy. Would that be a fair assumption? Uh, no, not really. No, I've got a lot of hardy plants in my garden. I think um, I've only got a small back garden myself, and it's probably about, uh, well, the planted area is probably about six by six metres, I would say. And um, out of that, I would say at least 90% uh, is hardy, and I would just leave outside. Um, there are a few bits in there where I might think, oh, it's it's a really nice plant. I don't want to lose it. And some of them have got their first winter coming now. Um, but I'll um, I'll just take some cuttings of those just as a backup and uh, leave them outside. Um, I am in uh, East Kent, so uh, we don't go down, uh, down low. So we probably go down to about minus six at most um, in a very cold winter here. But um, a lot of the plants that I've written about in the book um, are hardy to minus 15, minus 20, or even uh, more than that. So, um, because I really wanted it accessible. And I, I also understand that not everyone uh, wants to dig up their entire garden and has got the space to overwinter everything. So I really wanted to look at that as well. So there are definitely options of um, things you could overwinter, uh, you know, especially in colder climates, but uh, also lots and lots of plants that are very hardy. And um, yeah, I've got one that's hardy to minus 25 at least. Uh, so. Um, there's really something for everyone in there. Yeah, and if somebody was thinking of dipping a toe in the water with the jungle look, are there any really easy starter plants that you could recommend? Um, yeah, there's, there's quite a few, and 
Um, if I look at, uh, for instance, one really nice one, uh, which I've got in my own garden, is uh, Colocasia uh, pink china. And Colocasias generally aren't very hardy, but uh, this pink china has uh, proved to be very hardy. That went through the 2010 winter in a pot covered in snow, and it was still fine. Um, I can't actually overwinter any of the others. I've tried, uh, like Black Magic is another one, and I just they always rot for me, if I, even if I dig them up in winter. But that's a really nice one. Um, if you're looking at, uh, say, like a, a begonia, there's a begonia ciliata, which is almost like a big African violet. And uh, that's really nice because so it's got the hairy leaves as well. So you've got a different texture. Uh, also very hardy, big round leaves. Uh, love that one. And I think if you can fit one plant into your garden to give a tropical look, it would always be the Tetrapanex uh, Rex, I would uh, definitely recommend. It's got the big palmate leaves and um, it can create the upper canopy a bit. So it is quite a dense, uh, dense canopy. So you will need um, shade loving plants underneath. But it's just one, and even if you can grow it in a big pot, then I think um, yeah, that, that really adds to your jungle look. Mm. Yeah, just thinking about it as you were speaking, how easy is it to source some of these plants? Are some of them quite rare? Um, well, you can make it as easy as you like. Really. So if you, you can still get that look by, you know, by just going into um, some more specialist nurseries and uh, some garden centres as well sell quite a lot of uh, nice stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, for me, I am a plant collector, so some of my plants, of course, are quite rare. But uh, I think the jungle look is becoming more and more popular. So um, yeah, you can definitely get more and more plants all the time, uh, which is quite good. But um, it doesn't mean that um, if you want to start a jungle garden that you have just very rare plants that you cannot get anywhere. Um, and that again, that's not really what I was aiming for uh, at all with the book. I just wanted a mix of some things might be. Um, quite difficult to get or quite rare but uh, might be coming up a bit more and um, other things you can just get from uh, your local uh, garden center uh, so it's a, it's a, an entire mix of uh, um, some things are a bit more difficult to get and other things uh, might be very easy to get yeah i i as you say being a plant collector i do think maybe the jungle plants you could I could probably, speaking personally, maybe become a little bit obsessed and seek out things that are rarer and rarer. Um, obviously, that we have a lot of gardeners listening to the podcast who are quite advanced. If you wanted to try and get hold of something that was really rare or really choice to wow your friends, what, what would you choose? Um Oh gosh, there's so many things I could think of. I, I think I've got at the moment I've got a slight obsession with Bomeria, which is uh, part of the nettle family, and um, you can get them, and they're, they're a bit difficult to source at the moment. Um, but um, if you look at the leaves of those, so um, it is a nettle; it doesn't sting or anything, but uh, it is almost like a giant stingray, and you've got some really beautiful ones in there. And I think a lot of people will look at that and think. Gosh, that is unusual. I've never seen something like that before. Um, so, yeah, I think that's probably one of the ones that at the moment I'm very interested in. But I'm sure if you ask me in a year's time, I'll go, oh, no, you really need to get something else. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so, again, thinking about specific plants, um, if you had to choose maybe your quintessential jungle garden climber, what might you choose? Jungle garden climber, I would uh, I would go for a fig then, um, as I mentioned before. I think you've got um, such beautiful leaves on there. They're quite easy to grow, quite fast growing as well. So uh, they would like a sunny side, so that would be one of them. Um, yeah, I, I think I would go for that. And if you want something even faster growing, then there's some beautiful uh, vines as well, of course, like grape vines. Uh, Phytus cognetiae, for instance, is a really good one with massive leaves. Um, so that would be a good one as well. But I think my first choice of anything would be a fig. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the tetrapanax. If you, I mean, A, can you grow that in a pot? And B, if you didn't have that choice, what might you choose as a kind of small tree for a smaller garden? Um, I think the uh, the other one, which um, sort of gives the same look, um, would be a trachycarpus, so the, the palm tree. You've still got a big palm egg leaf then. Um, probably slightly smaller, uh, slower growing, I mean, and uh, but it still gives that effect. The, the crown is a bit more open, so you can grow a few more things underneath a trachycarpus, I would say, than, uh, than a, um, a tetrapanex. 
And so that is a very good alternative. And you can get them at different heights. So you can buy them as a tiny little uh, shrub or uh, sort of uh, uh, smaller size. Um, or sometimes you can get them um, like two meters tall, for instance, uh, as well. So you, you've got a bit of a quicker impact then. But um, yeah, I think that's a good alternative for the tetrapanics. Mm -hmm. And thinking about the ground cover level, um, I guess it's a fine line between something that is an effective ground cover and something that becomes a bit out of hand. Is there a particularly, is there a, a cover plant that is that holy grail of, of well-behaved but actually does its job really well as well? Um, yeah, I've got a couple. Um, I, one thing I've grown this year is um, hardy fuchsia procumbens, which is a really nice little a creeping plant with tiny uh, sort of blue and yellow flowers as well uh, that does quite well. That is um, relatively hardy. Um, it'll probably uh, die down uh, during winter, but uh, it should come back in spring again. Uh, but another one, if you're looking at it, more of a, a linear leaf, uh, then uh, off your polygon would be a really good one because you want to sort of create that almost like a yeah, the undergrowth, as you mentioned it as well, but you could create almost like a mossy layer as well uh, in there. And uh, the dwarfia uh, of your polga japonicas would be very good for that as well. Interestingly, I'm, I'm interviewing an author called Simon Morley. He's written a book about roses and he <clears throat> wasn't talking about the jungle garden movement. He was talking more about new perennial style gardening and the trend for wildlife gardening. But he seems to think that kind of modern gardeners are maybe turning their back on roses a bit. So I thought it might be good to just throw that one in is there a place for any roses in a jungle garden um i would think so yes there, there are some beautiful roses around actually which um could still give that uh, effect because uh, if you look at the rose leaf that is quite different to for instance a heart-shaped leaf so it would be a nice combination with that but um i've grown um uh, rosa omiensis pteracantha in the past i think that's changed its name but it's the one that's it's got these bright red thorns on the, on the stems and uh, they are beautiful especially if you've got the sun behind it so that would be something that could fit in very well um, and uh, Rosa Glauca the the bluish one uh, that's another one the foliage has got this sort of you know, glaucous obviously uh, look to it so slightly bluish grey um, and he's also a very good one uh, which I think could uh, easily fit in the jungle garden. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Will Giles's garden, which I believe um, isn't in existence in that form anymore. Um, no, it isn't. Yeah, which is a massive shame. And also mm. you mentioned Tresco. If people wanted to go and see really good examples of jungle gardens, obviously they can look in your book, but are there any that they can go and visit that are particularly good? Um, yes, I would think so. There's, uh, uh, I think with that, um, especially if you want to relate it to your own garden, which uh, might not be acres and acres uh, big, then um, uh, you could look at on the uh, NGS website, so the National Garden Schemes. There's um, uh, Mike Clifford's garden in Poole in Dorset, which is a beautiful one. And actually his garden is on the front cover of my book because it is so good. Um, and there are quite a few of those around, but uh, of course, yeah, Great Dixter with their garden, uh, the jungle garden is is very good as well. Um, so, but I would yeah, personally just really look at um, NGS gardens. But the other one, if you are going to see my Clifford in in Dorset, then of course Abbot's Breeze Subtropical is is a very very good garden as well, uh, with beautiful jungle plants and um, yeah, a very good one. Mm -hmm. And if people were looking for nurseries that did specialise in the plants in these type of plants. Um, I'm thinking probably in the UK, although we do get listeners from around the world. Uh, have you got any sort of gems that you could recommend? Oh, yes. Um, they're actually in the right at the back of my book is a list of nurses I recommend. And um, I think uh, the ones that I've used so much for jungle plants is um, Plant Base, which is in uh, in Lamberhurst in Kent or on the uh, East Sussex and, uh, and Kent border. Uh, this uh, Pan Global is a very good one in Gloucestershire, and of course uh, Creek Farm in uh, in North Wales. I think, uh, yeah, they are just amazing nurseries, and uh, um, I think all three of them even uh, sell online. So uh, you could just go through their website and have a look. But I think out of those three, you should be able to find something uh, very special and uh, for a good price as well. Thank you, Philip. I hope you've been inspired to try out some of the easier jungle plants and to slot them in amongst your existing schemes, as you really can find one to suit every situation. Thanks to you for listening. 
And thank you so much to those of you who've rated and reviewed the podcast recently after my constant requests. I can see a few of you have done so, and I'm really very grateful. If you could all do it, imagine how many thousands of ratings and reviews I'd have. So please take two minutes to do it. Thank you. Bug of the Week is up next, and Dr. Ian Bedford is talking about a bug that has very sticky feet. If you've ever had one in your jumper and tried to get it off, you'll know what I mean. Usually during March, the RHS publishes a hit parade of garden nasties, which lists the top 10 plant pests from the previous year. And every year without fail, there's one pest that's always on that list, and usually near the top. And that's the black vine weevil, Ocherinchus sulcatus. For the lucky few who've not encountered vine weevils in their garden, they're black flightless beetles, just under one centimetre long, with patches of tiny dull yellow hairs on their backs. And they have distinctive long broad snouts with small elbowed antennae attached. Active from June to October, the adult weevils spend the day hidden amongst garden debris, emerging at dusk to feed nocturnally on leaves, making notches all around the edges. Although unsightly, their feeding won't affect the plant's growth, but their leaf notching provides a useful indicator as to where their much more harmful larvae might be found. Their larvae are cream-white C-shaped grubs that live their entire life underground, feeding on roots, bulbs, corms and the basal stems of many different plants within borders, pots and containers throughout the British Isles. And the damage they cause will often result in stunting, wilting and even death to many plants where infestations are high. So how can we deal with vine weevils? Well, eradicating an established infestation within an open garden is near on impossible, since the adults will be numerous and widespread, and each will be a parthenogenetic female that will lay around a thousand minute eggs into the soil throughout the summer months. And the grubs too will be abundant underground, often protected amongst the roots of broadleaf evergreen shrubs and conifers. However, it's certainly possible that vine weevil infestations within open gardens could be significantly reduced by their natural predators, which can be attracted in by providing a safe environment with sheltered habitats and by not using pesticides. From predatory soil mites and nematodes to ground beetles, centipedes, toads and the insectivorous birds should soon take control. Eradicating vine weevils from pots, though, is a much easier task, and it's best done during early spring, whilst the almost mature grubs are still in winter dormancy. Simply empty the affected pots, dispose of the old compost, and then after checking for grubs amongst the roots, repot any plants into fresh compost. Failure to do this will allow the grubs to become active again, pupate, and emerge as egg-laying adults a few weeks later. Once repotted, a dry topping of grit or even crushed olive pomace could be laid on the surface to deter any future roving adult weevils from accessing the compost. Perhaps followed later by a prophylactic treatment of commercially available predatory nematodes that could be watered through the pot topping during the summer months. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast. 